I want to ask you to open your Bibles up this morning to the book of 1 Kings chapter 21. And I want to continue on the last couple weeks. We've been talking about Elijah and the evil king Ahab and the evil queen Jezebel. And I want to continue on that. But out of this, I want to show you a great, great example of breaking generational curses, breaking family curses. You know, I've, I've told this story before, but years ago when, when Tiz and I were pastoring our second church in, uh, in um, Adelaide, I think it was, was it Adelaide? Adelaide, Australia. And Luke, who's our pastor on staff, was a little bitty guy, and he did something. And when he did it, I grabbed him, and I shoved him, and I saw him bounce off the wall. He was, what, three years old, two years old? And I said these words to myself, I'm just like my dad. The difference is my dad didn't know the Lord. The difference is my dad wasn't a Christian. The difference is my dad wasn't a pastor. And that anger that was in my father, I saw, was also in me. And so I said, I'm just like my dad. And I thought of the saying, like father, like son. And so I decided, is there, I'm going to study this. Is there something in the Bible that says, like father, like son? And I found out that not only is it in the Bible, but it's in there over 325 times that what's in a father passes on to a son. Now, to be fair and we're, uh, we're equal here, Ezekiel said, like mother, like daughter. So you ladies don't get escape on this. <laughs> We've all got this. And, and so I begin to study it and I wrote a... Uh, I wrote a uh, book on it. It's been a bestseller on breaking family curses. And I've been thinking for about a year and a half that I ought to rewrite that book. And as I was studying on Ahab and Jezebel and their kids, I saw a new level of understanding breaking family curses, breaking generational curses. Um... I can remember back uh, about the time that uh, we were understanding of Israel and and God was leading us to move to Dallas. Uh, Benny asked me to come on his program. This was, gosh, 20-something years ago. And the reason Benny asked me to come on, he said, uh, we're sitting there, and he said... um, he said, listen, he said, I had a good friend, and John would remember the name, had a good friend, and Benny loved the guy. He traveled with Benny all the time, and he had been a drug addict and gave his life to the Lord, but after so many years, he went back to drugs. Remember this story, John? And Lacey and died of an overdose, and it broke Benny Hen's heart. And he said, I know that you are a drug addict, but you've stayed clean all these years. I want to know how you did it. And I talked to him, I started telling him about, you know, my biggest problem wasn't drugs, my biggest problem was anger. And I told him about how I discovered how to break family curses, generational curses. And I can remember this day, John was probably there and he said, stop the cameras. He said, we're not gonna do one day, we're gonna do, we're gonna do a week of programming on this. And then brought Tiz on and we talked about you know, I was, a, I was a Christian. I was born again. I'm going to make heaven my home. But I had this in me until I discovered how to break this generational curse. And I remember later that they played this and then they did a, a, uh, a, a big uh, crusade on breaking family curses and, at, at ORU. And I remember Benny getting a hold of me and saying, we have never had such a response from Christians of saying, you know, I don't need a healing. I need deliverance. I need to be set free. I had a good friend of mine that had a huge, huge church that would speak for us when we do our pastor's conference. 
And finally, one day, he says, would you come down and teach at our church? And, and uh, this guy is a huge name, very, very wonderful, wonderful pastor. And he said, would you teach on breaking family curses, breaking generational curses? And so I went down there and I taught, I think his church sat 10,000 or something like that. And uh, at the end, I said, how many would like me to pray to break off of your family or off of you a generational curse? Probably 95% of the church stood up, including all of his staff. And he told me later, he said, my church has been asking for me to bring you in to teach and he said, I wouldn't do it for a couple of years. I wouldn't do it because I didn't believe that anybody that was a Christian could have a generational curse until I heard you teach and saw my whole church respond. He said, now we, as a new converts class, this is part of our new converts class on teaching you. It's not just about getting saved. It's about breaking generational curses. <laughs> The world says you'll never change, but the word of God says who the sun sets free Amen. shall be free indeed. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to show you a different outlook on breaking generational curses. We've been talking about the prophet Elijah. We know about the prophet Elijah standing against Ahab and Jezebel. And we went all through this and uh, uh, the, uh, the prophet um, called down fire and he said, let the God who be God answer by fire. And all of Israel said that God is God. We know that Ahab and Jezebel were the most wicked people, the most wicked king and queen that the nation of Israel ever had. We also learned that Ahab decided that he wanted a piece of ground that was next to his palace just a small piece for a vegetable garden that a man by the name of Naboth had owned. He went to him, offered him money or offered him another piece of ground. We talked about this last week and Naboth said, I can't sell it. He went holding out for more money. He said, I can't sell it because I'm forbidden by the laws of God. When we were coming out of the desert, God said, this is for you, this is for you and named them after their, their fathers. I am forbidden by God to sell it. We know that Ahab went and began to whine and cry and, 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 and the Bible said he laid on his bed, turned his face to the, to the, to the wall and would eat no food. You ever have somebody in your family like that? What's wrong? Nothing. Are you okay? I'm fine. Well, this is a man. This is, this is not a little boy. This is not a kid. This is a man and he's a king. So his evil wife, Jezebel, comes and says, get up, you're the king. And, but she knew her, her husband was a wimp. And so she said, you know what, I'll go get it. And so we know the story that she set Naboth up, a fake banquet brought in two guys to be false witnesses against him, said he blasphemed the king and he blasphemed God. And they took him out and stoned him and killed this innocent man, stole his land, he left his Naboth's wife and children without any, any way of making a living. And so this is where we ended the story last week. Let's read something out of 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 17, that will lead us into understanding at a new level of breaking generational curses. Verse 17 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise and go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. Then Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. 
Behold, I will bring calamity on you, and I will take away. Now, here it begins generational curses. I will take away your posterity, and I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, like the house of Basha, the son of Acha, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel, and the dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all of the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he swore to his, that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. Now, look at me one second. Keep your place right there. We talked about last week, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And we talked about how God had been stirring me about be angry, but don't sin. Because the greatest problem I had, everybody knows about that I was a drug addict and a drug smuggler and, and all these things. And if I was at a, at a different church, I would, wouldn't say a drug smuggler. I would say I was in the import-export business of all natural substances. <laughs> and came and got saved. Gave my life to the Lord. But my greatest problem was not drug addiction. God delivered me that instantly. But I brought into my Christianity and I brought into my family and I brought into my marriage and I brought into being a husband and into being a father. I had a real anger problem. I know that's hard for people to believe because I'm so sweet now. <laughs> but I had a real anger problem. And, and I, what, I, what, what stirred me in this is I see some of the things that's going on in our country. I see some of the things that's, that's happening with this present administration. I see some of the things that's happening to our children and morals and, 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 and how far down we've gone in just less than two years. And it makes me angry. And I say, God, why don't you do something? And that's where we realize that the mercy of God is greater than our anger. Amen. But God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, right? So look where we get to Ahab. Ahab is evil, evil, evil. The worst king Israel ever had. And this is where we got last week to this part. So when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his body, fasted, and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. He's repenting for what he had done. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, now, this is God speaking to the prophet. See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring calamity in his days. Remember, we talked about this last week, and I said, God, you know, this is not fair. I want to see this guy fry. <laughs> he coveted his neighbor's land. But then we were reminded of another king who coveted his neighbor's wife, and his name was King David, and he also repented. And not only did God spare him, but our Savior came out of the lineage of this king who made a huge mistake and repented, right? Amen. But the story doesn't end here. Read the rest of this verse. So Ahab has humbled himself before me, because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring calamity in his days, but in the days of his son, 
I will bring calamity on his house. So here we have one of the most interesting stories about breaking generational curses. Now, I want to show you something, kind of a side note. Go to verse 29, and I want to show you that somewhere along the way, um, excuse me, not verse 29, uh, go with me to 1 Kings 22, verse 34. God says to Ahab, or says to Elijah, because he repented, now, let me just throw this in as, you're, as you try and find this scripture. This goes to show me that God's mercy is beyond anything we can imagine. Amen. You know, and I want to throw this out. It's just in my spirit. You might be saying, Pastor, I'd love to be a Christian. I'd love to know the forgiveness of God, but you do not know what I've done in my past. Listen, whatever you've done in your past, it cannot be worse than what Ahab did. This guy was involved with taking a whole nation and causing them to blaspheme against God. He's involved with murder, theft, ruin in a family. This guy was as evil as they can get. But God still forgave him when he said, God, I'm sorry. I can remember walking in the church the first time I walked in, had needle marks up and down my arms from shooting drugs, and got down on my knees at a movie, and I said, God, if you're real, be real to me. Now, nobody else, everybody else in the church looked at me. You know, I, 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 didn't, I wasn't as good looking then as I am now. Thank you. And all the church, you know, they're, oh, God, praying for souls, send us sinners. But when I came in there, oh, oh. But I said, God, if you're real, be real to me. And he was. He didn't say, go get cleaned up and then come back. He's, this is a come as you are party. He'll do the cleaning up. Amen. So God spares Ahab. Now, we don't have an explanation for what we see in verse 34, but somewhere along the line, Ahab must have backslid because now Ahab is in war with Syria and look at verse 34 of, of 22. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of the battle for I am wounded the battle increased that day and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians and died at evening now somewhere along the line he must have backslid and the judgment of God got back involved because the Bible says and if you read it in in Hebrew it's even more shocking they said the, 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 they didn't even know the king was out there. He wasn't dressed like the king. He had somebody else in another chariot dressed like the king. And some guys got there and he just goes Phew, and shoots an arrow at random. And it accidentally <laughs> found the only place in his armor where the armor was linked together, one place. And that arrow accidentally by coincidence, found that chink in the armor and killed Ahab, and he died that night. So somewhere along the line, he didn't do what was supposed to be done, and he backslid, and the judgment came on him. But I want you to now go from the judgment on Ahab, because we understand why Ahab should have been judged. But I want you to look at what we call generational curses in exodus 34 7 the bible says visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children until the third and the fourth generation now here's here's a scripture that most christians do not understand well you're just like your father or you're just like your mother, or you're just like your grandfather. I can remember years and years ago, um, a very, very, very famous Christian on television came to me 
very, uh, uh, an older man, he's with the Lord now, and he said, would you pray? There's something with my grandson. My grandson uh, uh, is just afraid all the time, and I won't get into details. And I said, is there, is there in his father this? No, how about in you? And he said, yes, I was so afraid of being separated and being abandoned and everything. And, uh, and his little grandson who'd only met me, little bitty, five years old, Every time he would get this anxiety, he would say, I want Pastor Larry to pray for me. I want Pastor Larry to pray for me. And so we laid hands on him. We broke that generational spirit of fear, and he, had never, he never had another problem again. See, we need to understand that these things that are in us can pass down three and four generations, and if we don't break it, they pass down three and four more generations. Look with me in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 51. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria. In the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, who had made Israel sin. For he served Baal and worshiped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger according to all that his father had done. When I was growing up, my dad, and, and I love my dad. My dad is with the Lord now in the last years of his life, gave his life to the Lord. But my dad was a mean guy. I mean, he was, he was mean. He was angry all the time. Uh, my dad, one time uh, I came home, I was, I don't know what, it was sixth grade or something, and I came home, and I was five minutes late for dinner, and I walked in, and my dad punched me in the side of the head and knocked me down and then kicked me all the way through the house. And when my mom came in to check on me, all my ribs, or a bunch of my ribs on my right side were broken from him kicking me. And I saw my dad be angry with my mother and I, you know, with my family. And I remember my dad hitting my brother in the face with a coffee mug at the table. One time we were, my brother and I were playing and, and knocked the plate off on the ground and he made me eat it off the floor without a knife and fork. And you look at that and you go, you know what? When you, I grow up, I will not be like that at all. And yet when I grew up, that same spirit of anger was in me. You look at the son here, and he looks at all that his father went through and all that his father paid the price for and his mother, and yet the Bible says he repeated the same things that his father and mother had done. Isn't that bizarre? But see, there's an answer to that. There's an answer to that. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 1. And Moab rebelled against Israel, and after the death of Ahab, now Ahazea fell through the lattice of the upper room in Samaria and was injured. And so he sent messengers and said to them, go inquire of Baal Zabab, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. Now, Baal Zabab, Beelzebub was the god of Ekron. Beelzebub, as you know, is another name for Satan. And Beelzebub literally means Lord of the Flies. So instead of going to Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sitka, or Jehovah Mekadesh, he goes to the Lord of the Flies to see if he's going to survive. That goes to show he's not thinking right. Can I have an amen? amen. You can say amen. It's going to get good. It's going to be all right. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. 
And when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, why have you come back? I I sent you on a mission to go talk to the Lord of the flies. (laughs) Why have you come back? And they, so they said to him, a man came to meet us and said to us, go return to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, it is because, is it because there's no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Then he said to them, what kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these things? What does this guy look like? And so they answered him and said, He was a hairy man and wore a leather belt around his waist. And he said to them, it is Elijah, the Tishbite. Now he had never met Elijah, but he knew who Elijah was and that Elijah represented the the, the house of God. So he knew immediately who it was. And of course, we know later what happened. He dies. Now, here's what I want you to look at. How did Jezebel die? Does anybody remember? They threw her out of what? The window. How did her son die? He fell out of a window. Now, there's two things that we can surmise from this. Either number one, there is a generational curse here, or number two, you should not have any windows in your house. I say it's a generational curse. Now, remember what God said to Elijah? He's, uh, or Ahab, he said, I'm not going to judge you. Now, evidently, he backslid, went back to worship in Baal, went back, backslid. But he said, I'm going to judge your house and all the sons in your house. Now, we look at after Jezebel died and Jehu became king, we, we see that Jehu called for the death Ahab had 70 sons, 70 sons, not even all of Jezebel. And he called for the death, according to the prophecy of all 70 sons, they took those 70 sons who were evil as their father and mother, they cut off their head, put it in a basket and placed it before the kingdom. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm looking at all this, my, 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 my dad gets a, a, a guy that shoots an, uh, shoots an arrow up in the air and sh- goes in the only spot in his armor. My mom gets thrown out of a window. My older brother falls out of a window. Seventy of my brothers get their heads cut off. I don't know about you. I'm repenting. I may not be the smartest guy on the block, but I'm repenting. But what we need to understand was exactly what we read, that the iniquity of the father and the mother can pass on to the third and the fourth generation. Now, what is a family curse? A family curse is can be anything. It can be, I, I can remember when we first moved the rock wall and I got a new doctor and I went to see my doctor and they have you fill out all this. Is there any family history of this? Is there any family history of that? And I filled it out. Did you, have your father ever had a heart attack? And I filled it out and she looks at me and she goes, well, you know, we need to do this when you do that because you're a prime prospect for a heart attack. Now this was 18 years ago or so. And I said, no, I'm not. She goes, well, it's in your family. I said, have you ever read a book on breaking family curses? And she goes, yeah, we're, we're actually our whole church in Rockwell is doing a Bible, their home Bible studies on a book called free at last. I said, I know the author of that. (laughs) And I said, I know how to break that family curse. Amen. Now, it may be in our family. That may be, it may be a physical thing. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a failure thing. Maybe it's an anger thing. Maybe it's a drug thing. Maybe it's a depression thing. Maybe it's a, a health issue. You know, when, when Lion got sick and then Tiz got sick, and I realized that, man, this is not a coincidence. This is, there's something there. And I realized in Tiz's family, there were a lot of 
family members that died of unique deaths, but they died early. So we stood up and we claimed the healing power of God, the wisdom of God and all the doctors and nurses, but we stood up and we said, we break that family curse of dying early because the Bible says he will give us long life. Do you understand? So it can be financial. It can be uh, uh, you know, your family keeps getting divorced. Your family keeps going to jail. Your family keeps getting pregnant out of wedlock. Your family keeps uh, 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 losing what they have. It can be anything, but we, under, we need to understand that this is a very spiritual thing. The Bible says like a bird that flies to its nest. You know, they have birds that fly from California, uh, from Alaska and migrate all the way down to Mexico and land in the exact same nest that it left when it went to Alaska. They'll come back and forth. Well, they, they don't have a GPS unit. They, they're not, it's not luck. This is what the scripture means. Like a bird that lands in its nest, a curse without cause does not come. There's something in that bird that is supernatural that draws it thousands of miles to land on that nest. That's the same thing with a curse. A curse without a cause does not come. It's not accidental. It's not, oh, I've got bad luck. There may be something from generations ago that's something that somebody else did that that iniquity ends up landing on us. Lamentations 5, 7 says, our fathers have sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. Can I give you just an example? When we're talking about like father, like son, generational curses, we're mainly talking about a physical family. I'm the father of my family. You're the father of your family. But you can receive a curse from your spiritual father if your spiritual father was teaching anti-Semitism, if your spiritual father taught um, teaching that replacement theology that, that God is done with the Jews, that's a curse because what is the very avos, avot, blessing? I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. So if you are growing up with this, you need to say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus and I break that curse off of me and my family in every way. It can also be the father of a nation. If you vote for somebody and you know that somebody you're voting for is pro-abortion, that curse well, I didn't commit the abortion. I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not doing the abortion. If, if you murder somebody, how many believe the curse comes on you? If you hire somebody to murder somebody, say amen. I'm, I'm going over to the. So if you vote for somebody that is pro-abortion, there's a curse on that, and that curse comes on you and your family, but today we can break that. Somebody say Amen. Are you following what I'm saying? See, this is one of the most important things that I can teach you. Why can't I get a breakthrough? The key is our fathers have sinned and are no more. They're gone. But we bear their iniquity. I didn't do it, but I'm bearing the penalty. I'm, I'm repeating this because of something that they did. Now, here's the key. The key is found in the word iniquity. In English, the word iniquity in our Bible has all kinds of different translations. But in Hebrew, the root word ayin for iniquity means an inner character. It means an inner character, and I won't go into all the different scriptures, but it means crooked or twisted. It's not just, oh, you know, have you, ever, have you ever seen somebody and you go, you know, that guy's twisted. It's not just he's a sinner or she's a sinner, but you ever say, that, that person's twisted. How many of you ever said that about your husband? No. <laughs> Something in that person is beyond normal. You look at the son of Jezebel and Ahab, and you look at what happened to them, 
and you look at that he carried on with this same thing. There's something in them that is twisted. It's the same thing that when I saw my dad, and God love him, and he became a Christian later, but I saw my dad with that anger inside of him, and then I became twisted with that same anger. I had to find out a way as a Christian how to get rid of that twistedness and make the road straight according to the word of God. Now look at this. On Yom Kippur, we bring two offerings. On Yom Kippur, they would bring a sin offering, and I got to say this quickly because I'm almost out of time. On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day in in the year, they would bring two offerings to the temple. One would be for sins to be forgiven, and the other would be for curses to be broken. Now, the sins would always be forgiven. They would bring the, the sacrifice, the lamb lay it, and the blood would shed the sins away. Now the blessings get to be released. They take, the high priest would stick his hands in the blood. He would go into the Holy of Holies where the power of God lies. He'd sprinkle the blood how many times? Seven times. How many times did Jesus shed his blood? Seven times. The power is getting ready, but then they'd go back to the scapegoat the one who caused the sins to happen. They would confess the curses, and if it went to a desert place and died, the curse was broken, the sins were forgiven, and the blessings were released. But if it came back and found the door still open, came back to where it's always been watered, came back to where it's always been fed, so many times we feed that anger, we feed that being negative, we feed it for generations and generations. Grandma was negative, mom was negative, you were negative, and we keep feeding that. An animal will always come back to where it's been fed and watered. But if you close that door in the name and by the blood of Jesus, that animal will die, and not only will the curse die, but the Bible says no longer will it be to the third and the fourth generation of curses, but I'll release on your family blessings of God for a thousand generations. Somebody say amen. That's why the word of God says he was wounded for our transgressions. The word transgression is the Hebrew word pesha, and it means trespassing. So we've trespassed. We've gone somewhere that we're not supposed to go. We're, we're, we're trespassing onto areas that God told us not to go. But the word iniquity is the unique thing. The word iniquity means something that drives us to do it. It's when, it's when David saw Bathsheba. He knew he wasn't supposed to do it. But something in him drove him to desire, covet somebody else's wife to the point that he set up her husband so that he would be killed. But listen what the Word of God says in Jeremiah 31. There's a time coming when no longer will it be said, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth have been set on edge. Now listen to what David said in Psalm 66, verse 18. He says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear my prayers. Now, when we first read that, now now focus in on me because we're closing in this. When we first hear that, if I regard iniquity in my heart, we go, what chance do I have? Because even Paul said, we've all got got sin in our heart. There's none of us that are righteous, no, not one. But the key to understanding this is the word regard. If I regard iniquity in my heart, and it's a Hebrew word that means it's like I look in the mirror. Remember what the the New Testament said? I look in the mirror and I forget what manner of man I am. It says when I look in the mirror and I see I've got an anger problem or I've got this problem or I've got that problem, but you know what? I I, I have no idea what to do about it, and you walk away and you let it stay there. Remember what David prayed right before this? He said, Lord, wash me from all iniquity and wash me from all my sins. 
He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. A wound is God, the bleeding on the outside and God forgiving what we've done. But a bruise is bleeding on the inside and it's breaking that inner character. Nobody wants to be a drug addict. Nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to have an anger problem. Nobody wants to be addicted. Nobody wants to be sick. But there's something in us that draws that thing to us. But when we understand that Jesus shed his blood seven different places, and by that blood, not only is every sin forgiven, but every curse is broken. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Can I have an amen? There's a story, and I close with this. There's a story that this lady, actually is a Jewish lady, her son was, became a drug addict. And so they took him to a center to get them set free. It's a wilderness type of school to work with drug addicts and, and people with problems in Montana. And so the family went up there and they watched them putting these people with drug problems through different games types of things. And the last one was a maze, a rope maze. They blindfolded her son and you're supposed to walk along the maze by feeling your way along and you stay in there until you find your way out. Now, anywhere along the way, you can say, you know what, I can't find my way out, and there's a counselor there, and you can say, help me, and they'll lead you in the right direction. And she said, we watched our son, and we watched him get more and more frustrated as he's walking along trying to find his way out. And then all of a sudden, somebody, the counselors are there. Anybody need help? Anybody need help? And he wouldn't ask for help. Then all of a sudden, somebody goes, I'm out, I'm out. And she said, I could see him get more frustrated. I'm out, I'm out. And he started going faster, and he started going out. And the counselor would walk up once in a while and say, need help? No, I can do it, I can do it. And all of a sudden, somebody else, I'm out, I'm out. And then somebody else, oh, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. And finally, he was the last one in there. And he got so frustrated. He said, all right, I need help. And they took the blindfold off of him, and he realized, there was no way out. The only way out is asking for help. Amen. When, I, when I first got saved and Tiz and I first got married, uh, you know, you're, you're almost a hero when you were a drug addict and got, got delivered. But what they didn't know was I still had the worst curse of my family in me, and that was a curse of anger. And it's not just, it wasn't just in, my, my mom is the sweetest, kindest person, but the rest of us, we had some issues. You know, we always joke, I remember when we were first married, and I come home one day, and we're living in this little mobile home, and I walk in, and Tiz is crying. And I go, what did I do now? She goes, oh, I'm just sad. I go, why are you sad? She goes, oh, my, my, this is the time of year my whole family gets together and we have a family reunion and I miss being at the family. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't relate to that because at my family reunion, you had to bring a gun. <laughs> Anybody have families? Like, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. We're on television. <laughs> you know, it just wasn't, you know, Tiz's family was like, leave it to Beaver. My family reunion was like Rambo. <laughs> and everywhere I went, people would call me out, you're going to do this, you're going to pre- you're going to go around the world. Just. But what they didn't see was I was the man of God at church, but I was a till of the hunt at home. I didn't want to be that way. I didn't want to be that way. I didn't want to have this anger in me. Until I said, you know, I'm just like my dad. And I looked up the word of God and I found out until Jesus came, there was no guarantee 
that what was in me wouldn't pass on to my children. When they diagnosed Tiz with this cancer, they said, we think maybe we can give you three months to live. And we're going to need to check your kids because you have a BRCA gene, BRCA gene that will pass on to your sons and your daughters, your grandsons and your granddaughters. And to Tiz, that was more devastating than anything. Is this why Lion got sick with cancer? Because of something in her family. And so we came back in the office and the nurse walks in before the doctor. And he's the most brilliant man, but he's still a doctor. He's not the great physician. He is a great doctor, but he's not the great physician. Is that okay to say? And she walks in and he goes, she goes, only he could have done this. Only he could have done this. And the doctor walks in. And she says, well, did she tell you? And she goes, well, I was starting to. And he goes, well, we checked. And it shows that you don't have this gene. Amen. But I know you do. Amen. So we're going to go deeper into testing. And we're going to test the cancer that we took out of you because it's gotta be in there. There's no other explanation. And so, you know, another what, three weeks or six weeks or whatever it was, come on, Lord. He comes back, he goes, I can't explain it. You have no BRCA gene. It will not pass on to your children. And that's the thing that we want you to understand. God is not angry with you. There, you may be born again. You, maybe you're not a Christian. The first step is give your life to the Lord. That's the first sacrifice. Let him forgive you of your sin. The second sacrifice is let him break every curse. Because cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Jesus did not just take my sin. He took that curse of addiction. He took that curse of anger. He took that curse of poverty. He took that curse of failure. And you and I, in every way, have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Can I have an amen? Would you stand with me all over the building? Forgive me, I'm three minutes over, but it's one of the most important things that I can teach you is that if all Jesus were to, was to do, if all Jesus was to do was forgive us of our sin, we couldn't love him enough, we couldn't praise him enough, we couldn't thank him enough. But look at me. He didn't come just to get us to heaven. He came to give you and me life and that life more abundant. He came to bring joy into our home, our family. He came that everything you put your hands to, God will cause it to prosper. Every place you put the sole of your feet. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, when you discover who the thief is, look at me. The thief is not you. The thief is not you. The thief is the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy what Jesus has paid for in full by his blood. And when you discover who the thief is, oh, but pastor, I made this mistake. I understand that. That's under the blood of Jesus. But the curse is broken. This is why Jesus said you cast a demon out and it goes to a desert place, but it comes back and finds the door still open. And it's worse than it was before. How many times worse? How many time, places Jesus shed his blood? We're redeemed by that blood. Say, I am, I am redeemed, redeemed by, the blood by the blood in every area, every area of my life. Of my Do you receive that? Amen. All right, I want every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Five minutes over, forgive me, but just very quickly, the first place to start is to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Larry, I've never been born again, or I have been, but I've backslid, I've fallen away. I want to give my life or rededicate my life to the Lord. If you want me to pray over you and, and the Lord to touch your life, 
I want you to lift your hand up all over the building and say, remember me in prayer. And, and keep it up. I see that hand. Keep it up the whole time, please. I see that hand, 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 that hand. Keep it up. That hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. God bless. That hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. Keep it up. That hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. That hand, God bless. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. That hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, God bless. That hand, God bless. That hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. God bless. Anybody? That hand, I see it. That hand, that hand, God bless. That hand, God bless. Give them a great big clap offering. Amen. Now, now listen. This doesn't work if you're just playing games with Jesus. Okay, I don't want bad things to happen, so I repent. We see what happened to Ahab, right? You got to mean business. That means you're going to start serving God. You're going to start living for God. You're going to come to church. You're going to start, start allowing God to change you by the teaching of his word. Amen? Okay, now we're going to pray together, but here's what I want us to include in our prayer. A breaking family and generational curses. Listen, they, they told my mom, your son's a junkie. Once a junkie, always a junkie. That's what the street says. But what the king of kings says, who's the son sets free shall be free indeed. Amen. So I want every head bowed just for a moment. Now look, look at me one second. Look at me one second. What do I do? The Bible says confess your faults. Confess it. When Tiz and I were first married, we didn't go to anybody for help. It's a miracle our marriage survived because of my violence and Tiz's cooking. <laughs> it was, you all were getting way too serious. You, you all were getting, I, I could feel that. It's a miracle, it's a miracle we survived. It's a miracle. But we didn't go for help because, you know, man, you're gonna preach around the world. You know, you're born again. You, you, you can't have a problem if you're born again. No, no, we're all a bunch of wrecks in various stages of repair. And today we're getting you through the paint department where you got a brand new shiny life ahead of you. Does that make sense? All right, I want every head bowed, I ride close. Confess your faults one to another. Now, you don't have to confess anybody. You're confessing them to God, and, 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 and I'm coming in agreement. Every head bowed, every eye is cold. You say, Pastor, in my life or my family, there is a spirit of anger or depression, and we want that broken right now in Jesus' name. Lift your hand up if you have this in your life, in your family, in your, in your home, in your, in your family. Now, put your hands down. Look at me. Look at me. See, the devil, will, we're, we're not done. The devil will tell you, 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 ought not, you ought not say anything because you're the only one. 90% of the building just raised their hand. And the rest of you were lying. <laughs> or you have a bad shoulder or something. 90% of you raised your hand. And then there's, I, I don't know how many more will go. I don't want to admit it, but I got it. Listen. I have no, what if somebody knows I'm not perfect? We already know it. But he knows everything. And that's all I, I don't care if somebody knows that I'm not perfect. I want him to take me to the next level. Does that make sense? All right, heads, heads bowed, eyes closed. Say, Pastor, in my family, there is health issues that, pass on from generation. It might be cancer. It might be heart attack. It might be uh, diabetes. It might be w whatever it is. It might be uh, uh, you know anything in health issue. I want this thing broken in my family. Lift your hand up all over the building. Yeah, sure. Early death in my family. There's early death in my family. Lift your hand up. Early death in my family. Put your hands down. Uh, divorce. Uh, unwed pregnancies seem to be in my family. Lift your hand up all over the building. Yeah? Yeah, we can break that. Put your hands down. Financial failure in my family. God says, everything you put your hands to, I'm going to cause it to prosper. It's time to reverse this. Lift your hand up all over the building. Lift your hand up. Lift your hand up. Put your hand down. Something else that I haven't named, but God's already spoken about it in your family. Lift your hand up and say, Pastor, I want this generational curse broken. I want this curse 
reversed. I want this curse broken in the name of Jesus. Put your hands down. Look at me a second. We're going to pray. Look at me a second. I didn't know we were going to do this thing about getting uh, the uh, John Patterson Award. Have you ever seen the movie Ghost in the Darkness with uh, Val Kilmer? That's that's John Patterson. Where they're building the railroad in uh, in uh, in uh, Africa somewhere, and these lions that are in the in the Chicago Museum of Natural History, these lions killed a hundred and something uh, of their workers, and that's played by Val Kilmer. Now they were going to give me the Tombstone Award because I look more like Brad Pitt, but <laughs> just didn't fit. <laughs> Who said Danny DeVito? There's never a coincidence. When they came over to our house and told us about this award they want to give us, we were in my office, in my study, and, and they said, where did you get this? If you've ever been in my house, in my study, there's a giant Star of David chandelier. The Tizen I found out of a beautiful, unbelievable synagogue that's closed down and, and in ruins and everything in Chicago. And we salvaged this beautiful Star of David chandelier. It's huge. And we have it hanging from uh, uh, our roof in my study. And this, John Patterson spoke at this same synagogue. It's amazing how things come together. So I want you to understand that if you're here today or you're watching, it's not a coincidence. There's no word in ancient Hebrew for coincidence. And when you see or hear of a blessing in somebody else's life, what does that mean? I'm next. Say, I'm next. I'm next. Say, I'm next. I'm next. God wants to bring in your life joy Amen. and happiness Amen. and peace Amen. in your family, Amen. in your home. Tiz and I are almost, we're going almost 50 years. Another four or five years, we'll be at 50 years of marriage. And it, it, it's because of this. It's because of this. Too many Christians love the Lord, but they don't understand of standing up and breaking. I bind you. The Bible says, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever you loosen on earth, say whatever. So we're going to bind anger and loosen joy and peace. We're going to bind poverty. My mom... We just sold my mom's house a couple days ago. They bought that house when I was five years old. My mom's 94 years old, and so we had a, we put her in a real nice place. That house is 800 square feet in the hood. 800 square. Scotty says Scotty's been there a few times with her mom. He goes, "This is the smallest house I've ever seen. It's so small you can't even change your mind." <laughs> We're from the hood. But you know what? When I learned God didn't want to, I may be from the hood, but I don't have to stay in the hood in my mind. Right? Lift your hands up. Let's say this out loud. I'm, I'm, I'm 14 minutes over. Forgive me. Say this out loud. Say, Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. I know I've sinned. We've all sinned. But I know this. You love me so much you sent Jesus Christ to pay the price in full for all my sin right now I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior Satan I command you get out of my mind get out of my body get out of my spirit get out of my home get out of my family get out of my finances get out of my future i declare in the name and by his blood every curse is broken and every blessing is released i bind anger sickness illness divorce illegitimacy destruction on my life and my family in every way right now I receive joy, peace, happiness, abundance, blessing, success, victory, 
long life, not someday, but starting today, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, if you believe every generational curse is broken, give the Lord a great big clap offering. Praise. Now, listen, listen to me. Let's say in the, in the area of anger, let's say in the area of anger, now, it, it takes a lot to get me angry now. But when I first started realizing this, it was, a, it was part of my nature. It was, uh, it, it, you know, whether a pastor or a Christian, I, you know, somebody driving the car, this and that, you know. I, I can remember w- one time in Phoenix, my, somebody did something to us, and my pastor started chasing this, this, these two guys. And I said, what are you going to do when they catch them? He said, we'll let you beat them up. <laughs> I'm not joking. But I I realized, you know what? God has set me free. And I am going to give no place to the devil to come into my family and and, and my life. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. Um, So when this thing, when this thing's, you're free now. But it's going to come back and it's going to, it's going to knock on your door and it's going to try to come back in. That door is closed, sealed shut by the blood of Jesus. Amen. We have one more thing of business. Would Bruno and Jessica come up and uh, you guys come up? You know that I am righteously angry about what our, our country is trying to do to attack our children. The way to beat the enemy is not hide in a corner. The way to beat the enemy, I remember when we were in a conference one time and one of our Navajo brothers said, the devil attacked me so I counterattacked him. (laughs) And so we're gonna make a counter attacking and, and to help with our children. Now let me throw something out. I believe God is speaking to someone to give a very, very large amount of money for a youth building that we want to build. And so we're, I believe God is speaking to someone, if God's speaking to you, and I'm talking about, because we are out of debt. We are are not in debt. We don't give a million and a half dollars to Israel and 50,000 meals a month to children in Zimbabwe and our orphanages and all that stuff. We don't do that at the cost of losing the house of God. We are out of debt. We are out of debt because of you and because of Jehovah Jireh. So I'm not going to get us back into debt, but I feel like God has put in my heart and spread it out. Tell somebody that if somebody would put a seed, a large seed, we're going to build a building for our youth, but before and and and, and uh, uh, to, to make this the the best youth children's program they can. I don't know if you saw our um, kids camp this summer with our kids there. Oh my gosh, it was off the charts wonderful. I believe we need to invest in our kids. Amen. Amen. And so we are bringing in to help with the youth because we want to divide senior high school, right? Senior high school and junior high school. And so Bruno and Jessica are coming in to come on staff with us. We stole them from Boston. And so we're, we're gonna do an official ceremony of anointing them and ordaining them and everything. But I want you to lift your hands towards them. And we know that, that number one, they're from Brazil. So how can we, how can we go wrong? And, but this is a step forward. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer. Our kids, the next generation, if the Lord, think about it, if the Lord tarries a little bit, those, those babies that are in, in Kid City are going to be in high school and junior high. We must invest in them with great leaders to keep them going and give these guys some help. It's, it's, it's worth the investment. Can I, have, can I have an amen? So lift your hands towards them. You, you guys too, we want to pray for you guys too. Father, in, in the name of Jesus, staff, come up, staff, staff, come up. John, Lacey, come up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise and glory. Oh, wow, there it is. In the name of Jesus, 
upon our youth pastors, upon junior high and senior high, upon our children. Father, we thank you. Give them divine insight, divine wisdom. Give them energy. Give them inspiration. Give them anointing in every area. For we feel, God, that our children are more than worth the investment of being raising them up because your word says when we raise them up in the ways that they should go when they're old they'll not depart from it now i want you guys to come and agree with me gordy come up with, come come up with me kids come up how many of you have kids and grandkids say this out loud father we claim the anointing of god and the spirit of god on our children and our children's children and we declare satan we bind you from touching our children in every way in home in school in the streets in the city and we claim that our sons will be like ephraim and manasseh and our daughters like rebecca sarah rachel and leah we claim a divine anointing on this next generation. It will be marvelous in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you agree, give the Lord a great big clap offering of praise.